Outrocast. Hey, Erica, can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I can see you. Uh, violins on the wall. Do you play or just cool decor? I'm in my mom's house, actually, and she plays. Oh, interesting there. Well, the yeah. first time I ever saw you was the 20 year olds don't matter material slash special. And that really spoke to me because when you're that young, you think that you matter and maybe you don't. Did you ever get blowback from that? Sorry to lead straight into it, but I wanted to know that right away. Oh, um, you know, the only time I think I got blowback was ironically in Boston when I was performing for a bunch of Harvard kids. And these girls got upset and they got up and left in the middle of it. And they said they were really offended by that bit. I think I might have pointed them out or something. And and then I was like, well, isn't that the whole point? Like they thought they mattered so much that I would care that they had to leave because they were so offended. <laughs> I was and like, that's the point. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's that same special when you spoke about the Lyft driver also being a comedian, actress, producer, et cetera. There's a certain part of your comedy that it's hard to describe what it is, where it's the truth. It's totally the truth. You're not exaggerating anything. And I think that's very refreshing because a lot of comics, you listen to what they say on stage. And then if you were to say hi to them at the merch table afterwards, well, pre-COVID, of course, yeah. you just, they go, oh, thanks, man. Cool, man. And you go, that's not the angry person I saw on stage. So right. you're like that. Yeah, I'm just being me and <laughs> I might be a little, ex maybe I exaggerate a little bit certain things, but I don't think I have a totally different persona on stage. And then, yeah, I try to be truthful because I feel like I can't sell things that I don't believe, you know, so everything is real. Has it always been that way for you as a comic or do you have some really bad one liner era comedy that you did at the beginning? I was a one-liner in the beginning. Yeah, I would oh, just, <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, wait, how'd you know? I totally started as a one-liner comic. And I remember how exhausted I was the first time I featured because I did 73 jokes, you know, to fill 20 minutes or something. And it was exhausting to remember each one-liner. Yeah. And I have them. I have them written down somewhere or my manager does because we were going to try to like put them all in a book at some point. But it is so tiring to just do one-liners. I mean, you know, kudos to Stephen Wright and Mitch Hedberg, who are brilliant one-line comics. But I just was like, I'm not, I'm not going to survive. <laughs> yeah, I love one-liner comics. To to make that very clear, Hedberg. Oh yeah, love. I mean, if but, you can do it, you can do it. You know, but I, you got to be like on another plane as far as brilliance goes. Like you have to be. To me, you have to be just like a genius. Right. I was always curious about that. Uh, when I was young, I got to see a lot of legends live, like Rodney Dangerfield. And he must have been 80 at that point. And I was thinking, how is he doing that? And then somebody tipped me off to the fact that he had an earpiece in and he was being fed the lines backstage. I don't know if that's true, but I would have to imagine that's how some of the older comics can do one-liners. Yeah, sometimes I've heard comics putting notes on stage, like where they put like note cards at the foot of the stage. So they just have to look down to get the line. <laughs> yeah. There was that Janine Garofalo HBO special where she had the notepad on the bar stool and all that. You Did you ever do that? Uh, I mean, you graduated from the one-liners, but were you ever a, a notepad comic? No, because I found that if I had, even having it there made me insecure like i didn't really know what was coming sure unless well, it's like an open if i'm working on something i'll have a notepad but not for a show professional well bring it up to speed and not just focusing on weird awkward past kind of things this new special that you did through comedy dynamics and the tribeca team when did you find out that you were taping a special compared to writing all the material Oh, um, well, I was supposed to do it in April. So I had found out a couple months before that, I think like in January or something, maybe February, that I was going to do it in April. And so it was supposed to be part of Tri Tribeca Film Festival. And then obviously that got changed. So then we, I didn't think I was going to do it. 
I thought it was completely canceled. And then maybe a month before or a couple weeks before we shot it, they were like, we're going to do it as a drive-in. So it was like I prepared and then I wasn't prepared and then I had to re-prepare for a different situation. <laughs> yeah. If I speak to 10 comics, you'll get 10 different answers as to what they've been working on during the pandemic, whether they've performed, how much they performed, et cetera. I'm assuming that was your first drive-in slash outdoor performance of that sort. It was. It, I, I was lucky in that I was able to do a couple clubs on the road before to prepare. And then, of course, I did all the Zoom shows, which I think helped me with the timing because the Zoom had the delay as well. You know, like the car, it would be like a delay laugh or reaction and a Zoom, the same thing. So I think the Zoom actually helped me a lot. But yeah, I hadn't done a drive in, hadn't done a single outdoor show hmm. before. Were there other comics there when you were taping it? Was there a warm up or anything like that? There was a warm up. Um, I now I feel horrible because I'm blanking on his name, but he was a really nice guy and he was a professional and did a good job getting them going. Right from the same series, I had the pleasure of interviewing Esther Steinberg, and she said that she was blown away by how. They knew to mic 30 cars. The engineers were just really smart in doing that. Did you know any of that was going on before you actually showed up? Yes, because I said, I will not do this if I can't hear laughter. Will not agree to do this. So <laughs> so my manager was like, no, we, you will hear laughter. I, I can't do it. I can't do comedy in a complete vacuum. It makes me go crazy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. And yeah. have you done gigs in any form since then? Apologies for not just going to your website and checking oh. the tour tab. No, you don't have to know that. Um, I have. I've been actually one of the few comics who's like decided to just keep going. And I know some people think I'm insane and probably some people think I'm a, a terrible person because <laughs> you're putting everyone at risk. But no, <laughs> but I but honestly, I've been, you know, knock on wood. Of course, I'm superstitious. I'm like, knock on all the wood, but I've been fine. I, I was convinced in my mind that I had COVID last year in March because I got yeah. sick twice in a row. And I was like, after that, I haven't been sick once. So I was like, I really think I had it. And then my immune system got like really strong because I've traveled for the entire pandemic. I've done at least 10 clubs. <laughs> and so I've just kept going. I don't, I, for me, I can't stop. I'm not good at like downtime. Yeah, what I was saying before about 10 different comics or 10 different approaches. It's just also how 10 different people live during the pandemic. Everyone's just got their own thing and they have to figure out what they're comfortable with. So if you're comfortable, and you're not hurting anybody. I yeah, I mean, know. obviously I was careful. I wasn't like going out and partying. You know, I know other comics who got it, but I know also that like some of them probably were drinking or probably were partying a little bit. And I'm just not a partier. So I would just do my show, go home, go back to the hotel. Be, you know, I was alone the whole time. It's not like I was like trying to be reckless or anything. Right. <laughs> you know, I was careful. Well, listening to your material, you don't come across as reckless. You come across a person that thinks about what's at stake and goes, hmm, maybe not. Maybe I shouldn't do that. I mean, well, you'd be surprised. I would say I'm reckless in romantic relationships, you know, getting into romantic involvement with people. And I think you can tell that from the special where it's like, oh, she's got issues in that department. But I'm not like, you know, I think we all comics have some sort of issue. And if you look at my special, you'd be like, oh, yeah, so she's sort of neurotic and, you know, falls for people that aren't right for her. But the prior special you spoke, I love this insight where you explain how not being married and not having kids at a certain point in your 30s is like breaking even in a casino. That's almost like a signature bit. Did you, when you thought of that, because I'm the one who's telling you that's great. I don't know if you know how great that is, but when you had something like that, did you say, I got to save this for the right moment, the right special, or did you just start immediately doing that bit? Yeah, that bit is also on my albums. Like there, there's some overlap with my album um, because this is my first hour special. So like my album to me was separate since it was just an album. So there's some of the same jokes. And that was one of the earlier jokes I wrote, actually. So I don't think I knew that it was that great. I just 
I really felt like it, it made sense because I had been doing a couple shows at casinos and I always, uh, when I, whenever I go to a casino, my goal is to leave the second I lose. So I don't keep playing to win. I play to break even. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I play to be like, you know, I'm not a loser here. If you're not a loser in a casino, to me, you really are a winner because you didn't keep going thinking, oh, the, you know, the tables are going to turn for me. No, they're not. <laughs> so, so that's how I feel sort of about romance too, where, you know, people think they want these things and then they get them and they're like, actually now I'm trapped with this relationship or with the family or, you know, things like that. So, um, so I, I think a lot of my, at least my early jokes are about looking at the bright side of not having anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you you without spoiling the whole joke or like ruining it by explaining it. It's brilliant how that leads to the other things that you don't have and how it, it's wonderful because a lot of comedy, it's one thing or another. And you're kind of moderate and in between all the different scenarios. It's not physical. It's not sketch. It's but there's delivery to it that that's great. But enough with the praise here. Enough okay. with the praise. No, I need it. I need it. <laughs> so the special came out officially yesterday. You could have pre-ordered it. You could still order it. Uh, do you know anything else that's coming up in general? Or is it kind of like, give me some time here. I just came out with a special. Yeah. I mean, I think in my mind, the wheels are turning for how I want to evolve now, just as a comic, because you know, I was so into the precision of writing jokes that now I almost want to just throw that away and just like, just be up there, you know, and be more, just be fr free to, to create a new hour. So I'm really like trying to figure out where do I want to go now with my act? Hmm. And, uh, so, yeah. When you put out material on a CD or a special, is that kind of a burial of the material like done? Yeah, I think so. I think I'm really sick of these jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the kind of comic you are, you can do that. Whereas if you were, say, Dice Clay, if you don't do the hits, then people are pissed off. You know, you suffer through the new material so you can get the greatest hits. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I don't want to be like that because uh, to me, that's painful to keep doing the same old stuff, you know, and... It's interesting because, yeah, I think that some of the jokes, some of my earlier jokes are very well written, but I just can't keep doing them. I'm like, I just, you know, I'm ready to move on. That's cool to hear that you have that kind of perspective on material where, you know, this was it for now. We're moving on to the next thing. Are you the kind of performer that's writing every day in some form, whether or not you use it? I think I'm thinking every day and I write some ideas down, but I'm not so disciplined like, you know, my friend Tom Papa, who I know sits down for a couple hours every day and writes, you know, very, he's like really disciplined about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm more just like, if an idea comes to mind, like my friend, I have another friend, Jeremy Hotz, you know, who mm -hmm. do, and he's like one of the funniest comics I know. Yeah. And he's like, this is all you do. When you come up with a funny idea, write it down. That's writing. Just <laughs> if it's funny, you know. So so I'm kind of in between those. Like I try to write something every day, but I wouldn't say I sit down and I'm like really disciplined about it. Jeremy Hotz, a uh, Canadian comic? Yeah. Okay, so I was randomly in Fredericton, Canada for this press trip thing. And I'm looking to see okay, what, what's in town tonight? Can I see a show? And he's headlining this huge theater in Canada. And all these people are like shouting out the bits with him and they know his dog's name. And it was just one of those things like, oh, I guess some comics have their markets. And then you find out, no, this guy's a legend in Canada. Yeah, he's like gigantic in Canada. He's not just like, yeah. And then I opened for him in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio, when I had just started. And I like bombed for like, you know, my entire set. And afterwards he was, he couldn't have been nicer. He was just like, he was like, they're dumb. What can I say? They're dumb. <laughs> well, that leads me to something that I'm curious about. 
with with comics, I find that there's two directions on this. One is that all their friends are comics and that everyone who's not a comic is a civilian and they don't work with, well with civilians. And the other one is that comics who only hang out with civilians and don't hang out with other comics. Or are you in between the two? I'm sort of in between, but I'd have to probably, I veer more towards civilian because, um, because... I'm just not like, I'm not like part of a comedy group. Like I'm not in like, you know, I feel like there are comics who like are like in these groups and they're like, you know, they're like the cool people. And I'm kind of like, I've always been more of a loner and I have comedy friends, but I, but a lot of them are working and they're busy. So they're not, they don't have time to hang out. You know, it's like, I would consider Tom a friend, but it's not like we're like, hey, you want to meet up and do something? You know, it's more like, do you want to do my podcast? And then like, it's all work related. <laughs> yeah, I find that that the the com uh, the comedian hosting a podcast is almost the way to catch up, and it's scheduled and it's forced. And otherwise, you may not have met up for two years. Exactly, and then and then I I mean I I do have comedy friends, so I would say. I would say I probably, if I really am honest about it, have more comedy friends than civilian friends. But my civilian friends, I probably hang, I see them probably more, <laughs> if that makes sense. At this point in your life, do your civilian friends? I love how you're calling them civilian friends. <laughs> Like they're not like they're not at war. Like I, I see like a civilian as like someone who's not like in, in you know, in the troops. <laughs> well, hanging out with musicians, I kind of learned that a lot of musicians don't hang out with non-musicians because they don't understand. And my mom, yeah, my mom's a musician and it's it's all musicians all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was curious if at this point in your career in life if your non-comic friends still try and give you ideas for material or they just know better? Oh, most of them know better. Yeah, most of them know better. If I if I really think about it. Yeah, I don't think any of them. Well, I mean, I have some fun. I guess they have to be funny. Like even, you know, my civilian friends, they have to be funny. So they might be like, they might say something funny and then I'll say, can I use it? But they don't, they're not the people who are like, you can use that if you want. <laughs> well, that's a sign that you've they made better. when yeah. they know better. Yeah. Circle. Okay, cool. Well, I got two more questions for you and then you're free. And they've oh, got thanks. nothing to do with your wonderful new special. You're so on top of it, Darren. Am I on top of the, the time limit? Am I on top of the, the conversation? What am just I on like top of? Just like keeping it going, you know? You're just like, it's like really like, it's good. I like it. The key word is concise. Like yes, your material. Concise. Okay. Thank you. First question. Uh, most people that I talk to are in entertainment don't watch a lot of TV by choice. Like they kind of do the opposite when they're not working. But when you watch TV... What show can you recommend to us for us that for those of us who need a new show to start? Oh, um, there are two, can I say two shows that I enjoyed recently? You can say five. I got time. Okay. I enjoyed I Hate Susie a lot. Hmm. Um with with uh Billy Piper. Is that her? Yeah, and it's on HBO Max. That was a very excellent show. And then um Call My Agent on Netflix. I love, which is a French oh. show. The, there's a French theme happening. Um, that's a really funny show as well. I actually have not heard of either of those shows. So you've, there's stuff going on the list now. And the, and now I'm watching the docu series about the Isabella Stewart Garden Gardner Museum with my mom about the heist, the big art heist. Fascinating. Wow. Again, that goes on the list. That was not on the radar. Everyone, you ask them that, they say Shit's Creek. Uh, they go, can I say Tiger King or is that too old? Oh, I can't say Tiger King. Okay. Uh, did you watch the Queen's Gambit? Oh, okay. Uh, you know. Are these comics? <laughs> Sometimes. They're watching the mainstream stuff. They got to dig deeper than that. Yeah, people say, well, well, no, what are you watching? And then I say, well, did you hear of Brockmire? Nope, never heard of Brockmire. You, you know, I auditioned for Brockmire and I almost got in. I was on, I was pinned for Brockmire for two months, which is the longest I've ever been, you know, when you're pinned, you're on hold. to. Yeah. Me. And it was between me and one other girl to play the bartender. And I never ended up watching it, but I don't think she, she had a big part. But in the 
audition the bartender girl had like huge monologues like she had a huge part but i think it might have been edited down yeah i mean not to spoil too much yeah they're drinking a lot in the show but it doesn't look like they're being served very much by by an individual interesting yeah so i think she was written out because in the audition she was like a huge part unless it's amanda pete's part which no was, it was no it was the younger girl the brunette girl hmm yeah i don't re really remember any bartenders but that was, was uh, written way down i think it was written way down which is interesting because it's like wow i could have gotten the part been so excited and then been like basically an extra <laughs> what will be what will be i guess and yes case or asara exactly my closing question for you as somebody who I feel has made it. And I say that because you're working, we see you on TV every now and then, but you actually have your own comedy special, which then, you know, when they introduce you to the stage and they actually give your credits, they don't have to say, she's very funny, give it up for, you know, you kind of graduate from that. Yeah, that's uh, true. The, they don't say, you've seen her in such films as Blank and Blank and you were just an extra you know those old tricks from uh, i do that i mean i they say new girl and i i didn't have any lines in new girl they don't even people don't realize that <laughs> well you've graduated because you they go oh the very very funny person you've seen her in her new special you, you kind of graduate so i say well she made it because if she keeps up on this track she gets another special there's another cd maybe there's a memoir in three years and she's a proper headliner so that question related to that is any last words for the kids last words like i'm about like what about <laughs> not gonna about perish but i mean like words. of the interview <laughs> oh, oh of the oh right okay <laughs> i was like that's a lot of pressure um last words for the kids do you mean like for for comics in general I would say anybody who sees what you're doing and they're like, how can I do what Erica is doing? Well, um, let's see. I, I had advice from one comic once tell me you got to just get on the road and it is not a romantic um, life and it is not an easy life. But the only way I think to get better as a comic is to to put your time out on the road and do the just do set after set after set without you know looking for a reward right away because the reward the reward does not come quickly you know so but i think the road is really the secret to getting better as a comic because you can do as many local sets as you want but you're not going to figure out like what's funny to everybody like what's funny in the middle of the country what's funny to somebody who's been married since they were 16 you know <laughs> like <laughs> like what's funny to what's universally funny as opposed to funny in the little pocket that i live in so i think getting on the road is is really important for comics and you got that advice after the dayton gig opening up for jeremy um yeah i think it was after that but jeremy's i mean people like jeremy have helped me a lot you know jeremy yeah. you know a funny story about jeremy is that he is um he's the guy I, I don't know if you watch this part of the special but where the hook hand guy is um you know the guy with the hands that and and the guy and the the comic that reacts like what the hell man what the and goes crazy that was jeremy I did not put two and two together there. Yeah, that was well, yeah, you wouldn't unless I told you. But so that was Jeremy. So yeah, people like that, find people you admire, you know, and um and look and ask them for advice and um and just keep keep doing keep putting the work in, you know, because it's not I don't think there's any magic potion to any of this. I think it's really just the grind that that helps. I mean, there was that magic potion 20 years ago when there were development deals. Like you knew somebody who worked on Seinfeld or mad about you and then you got one, but there is none anymore. Yeah, well, now there's something to be said about just, you know, getting good at, at the craft itself, you know, because no one can take that away from you. Outro.